pick a number of rejections that you want and just chase those rejections. Worst thing that happens is you don't get all the rejections you want because you get accepted by somebody, right? Like just be like, I'm going to get 50 rejections. Brandon, don't you, don't you have experience of this? I think this is something I suggested to you and didn't you like get rejected um, when you were, I mean, I get rejected all the time. No, you you but... got accepted for, for something that you were actually trying to get rejected for. Yeah, that's happened. And that, once or twice that stunk, but, um, <laughs> ADHD rewired episode 222. This is the show designed for those of us with really good intentions, but a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and speaker. The website is ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me tell you about this. We all have a story, and I'd love to hear yours. I'm looking for guests for upcoming episodes for the podcast. If you are interested in coming on the podcast, go to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast and click the Be A Guest button that's at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. And if you are in the Chicago area, I would love to record this interview in person in Glenview, Illinois. So if you're in the Chicagoland area, let's do that locally here in the ADHD Rewired Studios. Be a guest, schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast. It's the second Tuesday of the month, so if you're catching this early enough on the same day this came out, you can join me today for a live Q&A. We're doing it at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. That's 10.30 Pacific, 1.30 Eastern. Just go to erictibbers.com slash events to register. And yes, today's episode is the recording of last month's live Q&A. So when you see a live Q&A episode show up in your feed, there's a good chance there's a live Q&A that day. Just go to erictivers.com slash events to register. You can join us by audio or video. Just make sure you have headphones and are in a quiet location with good internet. Otherwise, you can submit your questions by text during the Q&A or when you register. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. There's a link in the show notes or just go to erictivers.com slash events. I'll see you there. Support for ADHD Rewired comes in part from our amazing patrons over at Patreon. And if you are one of our patrons, thank you so much for your support. If you're new to ADHD Rewired, I'm really glad you're here. Take some time to listen to some of the backlog or just hit subscribe in your podcast player so you get a new episode each week. For all of you who've been listening for a while, or you've binged on the entire backlog recently, I want to ask you to become a patron. Jennifer and Dan and Mike and Lindsay, I'm actually talking to you right now. If ADHD Rewired is a regular part of your audio diet, what's that worth to you? How have things changed for you since you started listening? Has your self-talk changed? Are you more self-compassionate? Have you learned strategies that help you adult better? If this podcast has brought value into your life, Rick, Heather, Aaron, Edward, I'm talking to you, and become a patron. You can give as little as a dollar a month or five dollars or more, or you can also obviously give more generously. Give what you can. The bottom line is becoming a patron is the best way that you, Laura and Paul, can help. You can help me, help you, and so many others like you. We'll also get access to exclusive perks. Like last week, I did my first unboxing in a demo of a device that I'm really skeptical about. Whether I piqued your curiosity or you're ready to say thank you, become a patron. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And if you've been meaning to do it week after week. Make this the week. In fact, set a reminder for today at 4 p.m. to go to ADHDrewired.com 
slash Patreon. Oh, and when we get to the break, don't fast forward through the ads. I recorded a jingle. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am here once again. It's the second Tuesday of the month with my friend, Brendan Mahan. Say hi, Brendan. Hi, Brendan. It's still sort of funny, but not really. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, go ahead. And we, we were talking about how we have both been invited to present at this year's Chad, which is pretty good. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. My, uh, my topic is, um, I forget the full title, but it starts with adulting. Nice. Yeah. I am in love with that word. I love it. Okay. I mean, I, I have, um, I don't know if I've you've seen this, my, uh, my desk placard that hashtag adulting. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i found i got this at um was that cost plus world market i was like yep i'm buying that thing and i'm not like i'm not like an impulse buyer for knickknacks at all um but i saw mm. that and it just it had my name on it we actually yeah. had a delting on it not my name so we have yeah. first uh yeah. we, <laughs> we have a number of people who have already this. asked questions and we have uh marisol who's going to join us um, right now, and she's going to kick it off with her first question. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. So my question uh, might be a little bit more towards Brendan. Um, it has to do with my daughter. She's uh, nine. She's in third grade. And she used to have a habit of picking her nails, kind of anxiety, boredom kind of thing. Um, and we've tried fidgets and stuff like that. But recently, she's let go of the nails. She wanted to grow her nails. And I'm, she was really proud of her because she stopped doing that. But um, But just in the last couple of weeks she's noticed her hair. And so she noticed like one little strand, is, mm. you know, has, you know, texture to it, but now she's started pulling it. Okay. Like one strand mm. at a time kind of thing. And I was always on the lookout for this because I know about trichotillomania and things like that. And if listeners are, aren't aware, trichotillomania is a, um, is a disorder under the obsessive compulsive. What's the word I'm looking for? Umbrella. Spectrum. Spectrum. Um, and uh, so it's a specific uh, disorder related to hair pulling. Yeah. And so I was talking to her about it last night and, um, and she said, she said in her own words, I'm afraid it's becoming a habit that I can't stop. Mm. So, How old is so she, she again? is nine, okay. nine. And so we've talked about, you know, we've talked about habits and we've talked about her nails and, and that kind of thing. So she understands that feeling of, I, I feel like I have to do it mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so, um, I was just wondering if you guys had any, any suggestions. So I thought she herself, I talked about fidgets. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, if I don't play with my hair, I'm just looking around. Mm -hmm. So she recognizes that there's a connection between the fidgeting. And so we talked about maybe getting some fidgets and stuff like that. So I didn't know if you guys had any suggestions. I, I have a few questions first. Is, is she aware that she's doing it while doing it? Yeah, and she, she is. is because she's, she's, she's looking for, like, she'll take mm -hmm. a strand of hair and she's looking for a hair that has certain texture to it. Mm -hmm. So when I do bring her attention to it, like, hey, kiddo, you're playing with your hair she knows that she's doing it has she been able to describe how it feels when she tries to stop i've not asked her directly but like i said what she mentioned was it's something that i'm afraid i can't stop mm -hmm. so i i get the feel well I, I did ask her i said are you bored um are you worried you know that kind of thing she said and she kind of shook her head at being kind of bored like and then she does it when she's listening to the teacher mm -hmm. but she's fidgeting with something and so that's why i asked her i said do you want to get a good fidget and she said yeah and so we're just i'm trying to look for something that might fulfill that that feeling so th there's two re there's two clinical responses typically for trichotillomania one is exposure and response prevention where you're really like sitting with that that feeling that urge um until the, the compulsion passes Right. And, mm -hmm. and it's hard because, you know, and I would highly recommend doing it with a trained professional um, okay. because it's going to increase that anxiety big time at first. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the, that, the, the idea behind it is to ride the wave of that. Your brain can't sustain that level of, of arousal. Right. And then it will naturally come down. And then over time, your brain sort of relearns um, how to respond to that signal and to, in a sense to decrease the frequency it sends that signal. Right. So that's mm -hmm. that's one piece of it. Um, and there's also a lot of big mindfulness uh, component to that as well. Um, the other is replacement behavior, right? It's like, what mm -hmm. are the replacement uh, replacements that uh, are 
more socially acceptable that are, um, you know, not making her feel bad about, you know, about mm-hmm. doing it. And at least she just, she's just doing like the split ends or is she like actually plucking hair out? No, she's, she finds a hair that has like a certain texture to it. Uh-huh. And then she, she pulls it okay, out. Okay, So she's getting a little bit of a dopamine hit every time That's she gets that plucked. Yeah. Yep. yep. That's what oh, I'm afraid what of. Happens. <laughs> um, Once she and pulls then, it out, what does she do with it? Then I think she kind of she kind of plays with that one a little bit, and then she just lets it go, and then she looks for another one. Because on so, the replacement side, I'm thinking thread. That's what I was thinking. Is a frayed like, is ribbon there a thread that's going to have the right kind of texture to it, and uh, whatever that texture is, mm-hmm. might that be a a replacement for pulling hair out? That's uh, I, was, I don't know. Maybe it won't be, but yeah, that's what I was thinking, and or I was thinking maybe is there some kind of dangly thing that has kind of a furry hair kind of texture or something remember rabbit's but, yeah, feet those are gross <laughs> well, what, i missed that remember what rabbit's, rabbit's feet. feet rabbit's feet okay um but i mean there's all kinds of, of uh, fidgets and i think every person is uh you know attracted to or, or, or different types of, of textures and sensations so maybe experimenting um the one thing mm-hmm. that i would say about fidgets is make sure they, they are visually boring Mm-hmm. Right, so but I think that's yeah. one of the you know when I've seen these like fidget spinners that light up, I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right? Like that's the worst idea, right? Yeah. It's, yes. it's like yeah. have a single color, have it look really boring, but have it you know satisfying for your fingers, right? Have you seen those rings that have an inner ring that sort of you can spin like on your finger? Yeah, like maybe yeah. something like that. Um, uh, do lanyards? I mean, I don't know if the <laughs> teachers would like that though. Well, um, she has a lanyard for school, like okay. with her ID on it and that kind of thing. So I was thinking maybe like tying a, f- a frayed ribbon. So you had kind of those strings mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. going on. So I thought maybe right. something like that. And I have talked to her teacher about it. So her teacher actually mentioned it to me and I had noticed it. So mm-hmm. I've talked to her teacher about fidgets and, and things like that. So we're on board. Cool. And I know that, that um, this wouldn't really apply for, for uh, home but, or for school, but maybe at home, if she has like blankets that maybe collect hair, she can you know, pull, you know, get those out of the, the weaves of the blanket. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or stuffed animals that have that mm-hmm. kind of feeling. And we did that at bedtime. I said, well, Hey, why don't you use the stuffed animal, you know, and see if maybe that helps you or something like that. She doesn't seem to do it at bedtime. Okay. She doesn't do it a whole lot at home. I think it seems to be a school thing okay. where she's trying to listen to the teacher, but she's getting bored. Can you do anything around being in school and, and, upping her awareness in a different way. Like, can she stand up? Can she get a, a ball to sit on? Can she, you know, I, I can anything like that. Her teacher, her classroom has um, flexible seating at mm. least. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk to the teacher about maybe, you know, if she can, you know, sit on one of the, like the wobbly discs or something like that and, and yeah. see if there's something we can do. Cause a lot of times it's when she's sitting on the carpet you know, and they're supposed to be listening to the teacher Um, or even when she was telling me about when she was in doing some group work with another student, you know, they're reading passages to each other and she's just, you know, she's just playing with her hair, but she's listening. And that was another problem is that the teacher thinks she's not listening Mm. because she's doing something else. And so she was feeling really bad because the Mm. teacher keeps saying, you know, that brings in some anxiety too, though. Yeah. Yes. That might be in here somewhere. Like she's, she starts to play with her hair because she's bored. And it might just be the texture's fine for boredom, but now her anxiety goes up because yeah. she's nervous of what's the te- what is the teacher thinking, and that might be the thing that's yeah that's where the mindfulness component comes in. But I think there's also a piece of social navigation that that's equally true for for kids as it is adults. That like it it does give the appearance of boredom, right? Mm-hmm. So there needs to be something where where there's a uh, self advocacy component where you're communicating like. If I'm doing this, that does not mean I'm bored. It, it, it helps me listen or pay attention. Um, right. You know, so whether it's a work meeting or um, although the, last week I was uh, at a stoplight and I looked to the left of me and there was someone doing that. And so I was just like, I had, I was completely staring at them. And then they, they, they had the feeling of like someone looking at them and then they looked at me and he totally caught them in the act. And then I just smiled and looked back. Um, yeah. It was just, <laughs> You know, um, it's funny you mentioned the self-advocacy because, in fact, when we were having this discussion last night at, bed, at bedtime, um, I told her, I said, well, I can talk to your teacher and let her know that sometimes it looks like you're not listening, but you really are. And I, But I told her, I said, why don't you tell her tomorrow and say, you know, I'm sorry, it looked like I wasn't listening, but sometimes when I'm doing something else, it helps me to listen better. 
And, and I actually taught her the words self advocacy. <laughs> you know, I said, it's good for you to tell your teachers what you need and mm-hmm. how you're feeling. And she's very hesitant. She, she doesn't really want to do it, but of course you know, she is. She's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. And so I told her, I said, I can talk to your teacher, but I really want you to think about yeah. maybe telling your teacher yourself. Right. Yeah. And so. a nine year old is going to be hesitant to do that. Yeah. yeah. That's normal for nine. Um, yeah. But learning that skill is important. Yeah. And that's a way to frame it um, is you, sh- well, why don't you talk to your teacher tomorrow and say to her, like, the reason I'm asking you to talk to your teacher is because learning how to do that is important. Mm-hmm. And this way we get to do two things. One, you get to tell your teacher this important piece of information. And two, you're practicing this skill of, of self-advocating or, or just speaking up for yourself, however you want to put it, but giving yeah. them the perspective that that skill is important and so too is what you have to say can make yeah. it sometimes a little bit easier for the kid. And you know your kid better than I do. If that's going to make her feel overwhelmed because that's too many things that are important, then maybe yeah. go in a different direction. But sometimes that reason is useful. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so I just encouraged her and I said, you know, you can think about it and, and we can practice and that kind of thing. So Which is lucky okay. she has you as a mom. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I Thanks, appreciate Marisol. it. All right. What do we have next? Oh, I just had one other idea. You could also show her a picture of, of me and my head and say that I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you should get a picture of you with the dreadlocks and we could do a before and after. There is that. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to see that picture. <laughs> All right. I want to uh, answer uh, Crystal's question who, uh, Ask for, do I have any advice for balancing uh, work and school? All right. Um, and let us know if you want to uh, come on live uh, and just put go live in the, uh, in the Q&A. Um, but I think, you know, there's a book that you guys probably have heard me talk a lot about uh, recently, um, over the last year anyways, uh, The One Thing. And in the book, The One Thing, he basically, they, they talk about how the idea of, of balance is bullshit, right? That it's all about counterbalance and, and thinking about things in terms of sort of seasons, right? So it's, you know, this idea of work life balance things that we have everything come always in like this yin yang and everything's in harmony. And you're always in a certain, you know, you're at work just the right amount of time and you're home just the right amount of like, it doesn't work that way. And the analogy that they use in the book was a, of a, of a ballerina dancer who can stand at point. Like they're not actually, balanced as like perfectly balanced they're making so many micro adjustments to make it appear like they're balanced so it's Mm -hmm. looking at so if you're in school like you're good you're going to be off balance for a while right so you know looking at the the time frame of of balancing those two things and say all right where am i going to be able to where am i going to be off balance for this period of time and then identifying when that period of time is done, how do you then kind of counterbalance the, the other piece of this? Right. You know, I know for, for me as a, as a business owner who has some, certainly has some workaholic tendencies, like this is a, a struggle uh, that, that I do have. So it's looking at how do I do things in my environment uh, to create structure, to help in a sense, push me towards the other side of that, of that balance. So what do you think, Brendan? What's, what's your take? I mean, I was sort of heading in this direction. I was just, I was thinking if we're talking about school and work balance, which one's primary, which is again saying there's no such thing as balance, right? Like if, if this is coming from a kid who's in their twenties, then probably school matters more. If they're like in undergrad and their job is, I don't know, working in a burger joint or something like that, then school wins. But if you have a career and you are working as a lawyer and you're also and you've already got all that schooling nailed down and now you're pursuing an MBA, probably your job as a lawyer is winning and your MBA is sort of the side thing that's happening. So looking at it that way matters, right? Like in terms of time commitment, in terms of energy commitment, in terms of what your expectations are going to be. Amy, my wife just recently finished up grad school. She actually graduates uh, in two weeks, but she's all done with her classes. And we had a few conversations where I was saying to her, like, you don't need to get an A. There's no scenario where you getting an A in this classroom, in this class is going to benefit you professionally. Like, that's not a thing that's going to happen. So get a B 
and breathe more. Like just calm down a little bit, go hang out with our family or go out with friends or whatever, sit down and read or color or whatever you want to do. It's okay to take a break and get a B as opposed to working incredibly hard to get an A if you're in grad school and you're not in a ridiculously competitive field that's where the B or the A matters. So which Brendan, is my, you- my brain just uh, had an image of a cookie monster in a graduation <laughs> gown saying, <laughs> B is for breathe. <laughs> that's good stuff. I dig that. <laughs> my wife looks nothing like cookie monster. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I hope that helps. Um, you know, and, and, you know, thinking of this too, when I was in grad school and, uh, next to, uh, the, my move that I did last year, grad school was the hardest thing that I had ever done. And there were people who were doing grad school, had the internship and were parents who also had a job. Like I have no idea how the, like this, I could barely do the grad school and the internship. And like, I was just responsible for myself. Right. Right. So, you know, I think it's also important to not compare yourself to other people. Like look to see what is it that you can do? What's, what's your ability? And it might not be the same as far as what you can juggle as other people's are. And that's, that's fine. Like do what Mm -hmm. you need to do to get to where you want to go. And also this person has ADHD. Talk to disability services Mm -hmm. in your school, wherever, whatever that looks like, talk to them and get support from them because that matters too. And that's going to help you balance and counterbalance and, energy management, all that stuff, because you'll get a little bit of accommodations here and there, and that'll make your life easier. And that matters too. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to Amber's question. Okay. All right. So, uh, Amber asked, uh, so coming to the pressure, I got new closets and had to get rid of the old ones and now have mountains of stuff in my room for over six months. Now, how do I figure out a place for everything? I like this question. So um, I'm intrigued by the fact that she like, I'm trying to figure out how to get new closets and get rid of old closets. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Um, I'm assuming it's just the internal stuff and there wasn't just like a gaping hole in space. And then they put a new one in. Maybe. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Um, but dealing with the piles of stuff that have, have where there's been some inertia and there's been just lack of movement. So right now, uh, in our so we're recording this in May, although it'll be out in June. Um, in our alumni membership community, we're doing a 31 day challenge, and you, you get you can start this any month, any time of the year. So we started this on, on May 1st, and the idea is so it's about decluttering. So you take on the on May 1st, um, since it'll be out in June, I, I'll let's go June 1st. Or July, because it'll the future. So you'll have two weeks to, I'm thinking in podcast time, it's like, it's, I'm, you know. Yeah, you give know, me a second. <laughs> right, right. So we're, we're fast forwarding. All right, for so different time warp. So it's July 1st, and there's uh, 31 days in July, right? I actually do that, like, that poem, 31, 30 days, that's September, April, June, and November. Yeah, 31. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I have to do. All right. So on July 1st, get rid of one item. On July 2nd, get rid of two items. On July 3rd, three items, so on and so on. If you do every day, that's 496 items. You can check my math. I might be off, but I'm pretty sure it's 496 uh, items. So I'm in the, I'm on uh, day eight right now uh, as if we're going back to May. Time work back. <laughs> All right. So, so far I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten rid of uh, um, what are they, 36, yeah, 36 items so far, you know, and it's, like I counted like two pens that I threw away today is in, in that count. All right. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it starts easy and then it's, it sort of uses that, that momentum uh, building factor. Right. So you're looking at this room that has had this stuff in there for six months and it's overwhelming. So, you know, ask yourself the, the question, what's one thing that I can put away, throw away, donate, right. And just start mm-hmm. with one thing. Yeah. And if that idea doesn't appeal to you and you need a different one, another thing you can, not that it's not a great idea because that's an awesome idea. Um, it's also a really good way to save money. Um, save a dollar and then save $2 and then save $3. Uh, but another option is you can pick one kind of thing and put that in the closet, right? So like, I'm just going to put the pants in and that today I'm putting in pants and, and tomorrow I'll put in pants too until all of the pants are in there. 
or and related to that, you might there might be some organization that needs to happen. Maybe all you do is you rearrange your piles. You have a pile of pants, a pile of blouses, a pile of coats or shoes or whatever. Um, but that's a that's an option too. And I was just doing this with a client two days ago um, with Legos. So if you think a closet is bad, <laughs> <laughs> like specific pieces of Legos, uh, he had a, a mostly made Death Star in the wow. middle of his room. Yeah, he had a kind of sort of built orange car thing. And then he just had piles of Legos all over the place. And I was like, all right, well, let's look at this and figure out what stuff doesn't like, where can we create breaks in the Legos? Like all of these orange pieces, they go with the car. All this gray stuff goes with the Legos or go, I'm sorry, goes with this death star. Mm -hmm. And then this, these red and blue things and yellow stuff, they have nothing to do with anything. That's just you dumping out Legos to find a gray piece or an orange piece. So that you can clean up right now. Like that, that's just hand. There's no thinking. Just take mm -hmm. handfuls and dump them back in the bin. So with your clothes, you might also be able to sort of form pieces of stuff that works organizationally to do it that way too. And Eric's uh, camera fell asleep. I'm still here. No, nobody would have known on the podcast. <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> that your camera has narcolepsy. Um, <laughs> but so. So now, now to cue all the listeners in. So my camera goes off like every 20 minutes or so. We're, we're researching the problem. Um, <laughs> now, now that I've, I've hired out some of my executive functions. Uh, so I'm not, I don't just think about this problem. I'm actually, I have someone on it trying to solve it. Um, and then Brendan pointed out that since it, my camera falls asleep periodically that it has narcolepsy. It's awesome. Yeah. It's the best. Um, but yeah, so sometimes you can just go like the stuff. I'm going to clear up this pile near the bed because it's sort of off on its own. Well, then get rid of that. And get help to like whether it's a, you know, one of the things I've learned because I, you know, I have not mastered clutter or stuff organization. Like I'm good with time. Like I'm pretty good at, with how with planning and calendaring and goal setting. But stuff, I'll still, like, I'll be looking at it. I'll be holding something, walking around my house, like, where do I put this? I don't know where to put this. Like, I'm just, like, walking in <laughs> loops, like, I don't, I don't know what to do with this thing. Like, my, it's, so I've I'm, I'm been learning, like, more ways to think about stuff and the questions to ask myself and mm -hmm. also those red flag kind of thoughts. You know, like, for when we're thinking about time, like some of those red flag thoughts I, ha I have or when I know that when I have the thought, I sort of stop and correct the action where it's, oh, I have plenty of time or that'll just take five minutes or I don't need to write that down. Like if I have any of those thoughts. That's my red flag thought to stop. Right. It's like, yep. no, I probably it still take me longer than I think. Nothing ever takes me five minutes. And absolutely, I need to write this down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so some of it with, when it comes to stuff, some of the, the, the sort of things that I catch myself saying is, hey, well, I might need this one day. Like, mm -hmm. It's amazing no, how won't. often I catch myself thinking that, or there's nothing wrong with this item. Now I haven't used it in 10 years, right? It's like the, the just in case it's like, it's like a cancer of my thoughts when I, you know what crap. has been useful for me yeah. in that area is I think this would be useful for, but and the critical part next is I'm not talking, I'm not thinking this would be useful for mowing the lawn or for, decorating the house i'm thinking this would be useful for a kid who is living in poverty and doesn't get enough toys mm -hmm. this would be useful yes. for someone who is starting a new podcast this would be useful like who would this be useful for like and then how can i get this to that person because it helps me get rid of stuff more efficiently i wish they made it easier to get rid of electronics mm-hmm yeah. You know, I wish there was a little like side bin on like attached to your recycling bin that is just like put recycle because yep. I just have like a box of of random electronic stuff that I don't want to throw in the garbage because I don't really want mercury and all that kind of stuff leaking into our water system, you know, because yeah. I'm because I'm good like that. Right. Right. One of the things that I've started doing is especially with the warmer weather, um, there's areas that I drive through where I'm forever seeing people who are homeless and people who need to a little bit of something right mm -hmm. so i'll create bags for them because mm -hmm. we buy there's some boxes of stuff that we buy where my boys will eat like a quarter or not quarter we'll eat three quarters of it but there's something in there that they don't like right so it might be a box of like I don't, i'm making stuff up right now but like doritos and cheetos and kit kats i don't know and there's no way they're going to eat doritos right but they want the other two 
So, so you go drop off all the, 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 the black jelly beans is what you're telling me. Right. Kind of. <laughs> as long as it's prepackaged and it's not like nuts, but I'll, so I'll make a, a bag that's like got that stuff in it. And I'll also buy an extra thing of like juice or whatever for these bags. And I'll also find if we've got stuff that we don't need, right. I'll throw some of that stuff in. And I also get stuff like, like band-aids and toiletries and stuff, but I'll throw in like, here's a book that we're never going to read. It's awesome. But you know what? If I'm homeless and I'm stuck on the street and I have nothing to do, a book would be helpful. And here's like a, a coat or a, some, a pair of something, something that is also good. Even if it's not going to fit that person, it doesn't matter. You ever do, they it, can with, certainly you ever do that with your kids in the car? Yeah, all the time. Cool. cool. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. My boys have said to me like, dad, homeless people must love you. I'm like, I don't think that they know who I am. Like, <laughs> it's never the same person. But yeah, okay. <laughs> no, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and it what, sometimes means we have to have hard conversations, but yeah, and what a okay. cool thing to teach your kids too. Yeah, wow. Uh, let's do one more question, and then we will uh, we'll take a break. Um, and there's a, a, a comment in the chat about uh, you can find the recyc- electronic recycling dates in your county, and I totally know that. But there's more steps that are involved. That's why I just I wish that it was just attached to the recycling bin. Yeah. But now I know of a, a action step to take as I start to getting in the higher numbers of my uh, 31 day cluttering challenge that that basket will be empty by this time next month nice all right amber um see also i need to find an internship and i think i find that so scary that even the good intentions flee my head as soon as they can how do i get courage together to actually do it all right so when we think about what is courage it's being scared shitless and doing the thing that you're scared about at the same time. <laughs> like it's so I think sometimes people think about, all right, I want to wait until I'm less afraid. Like that's not courage. That's avoidance, right? That's avoiding hard feelings. Right. Um, so leaning into the stuff and saying, you know what? This might be scary. I might be really overwhelmed or anxious about this. Right. But I can do that anyways. Right. And so not to minimize it by any means, but to acknowledge it and say, yeah, and I can move forward doing that. Um, so, you know, I would want, I, I'd be curious uh, what if you've identified any specific things that are making you feel uh, anxious. Is it like the amount of steps that's involved? Is it the fear of rejection? Because I think the what the, is feeding that anxiety depends on how you respond to it. Mm-hmm. And. Ma- uh, just a couple thoughts on my end. One is make a list of all the things that you have to contribute to an internship wherever you go. All the reasons that they want you. Not the reasons that they don't want you. <laughs> the reasons that they want you. Like, what are you going to be able to provide for them? And there's plenty of stuff that you can provide. Think beyond your coursework. Think about stuff you, you're bringing in that's not, that has nothing to do with what you're learning in school. Because that's going to help you feel like you belong there when you go on these internships and go seek out these internships. Also, pick a number of rejections that you want and just chase those rejections. Worst thing that happens is you don't get all the rejections you want because you get accepted by somebody, right? Like, just be like, I'm going to get 50 rejections and that's fine. Brent, don't you, have, don't you have experience of this? I think this is something I suggested to you and didn't you like get rejected um, when you were like or you I mean, get, I get rejected you, you, all the time. You, you got accepted for for something that you were actually trying to get rejected for. Yeah, that's happened, and that um, I, once or twice that stunk. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but and, but that's another thing is try like go and be like I don't even want this. I I don't even want to be here, and go and apply. And I've done that before. I've actually gotten accepted to places that I didn't want to get accepted at, and it felt really good to turn them down because it like flips your whole head upside down. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I really don't want to be here. Like, I'm just going to not do that with you. And I mean, it's a little hard because you're panicking and you're like, oh, I need an internship and I'm going to turn this internship down. Like, that seems like a bad idea. Once you have the mindset of rejection is okay and you're like, I want to get rejected 16 times or whatever, it feels a little bit better going through and interviewing them because the, the worst thing that can happen is you can get accepted, which is upside down. Right. And, and, you know, we think about this, you know, this is, uh, uh, and we're thinking about sales. I know this isn't sales, but it sort of is. You're trying to sell yourself to, to get the, to get the, mm-hmm. the internship. The more no's you get, the better the likelihood you will hit a yes. So it's sort of another way of looking at going after the no's will get you to the yes. 
Right. Right. And if you're and if you are feeling really, really stuck where it's it's this overwhelming, really impairing anxiety, I would encourage you to find a, a counselor who can help you work through that. Because you know, anxiety is a can be a bitch, right? Like mm-hmm. it's a beast. Like, our strong emotions are such convincing liars to us. Right. It's it's trying to it's it's convincing us that this thing we want to go do is really dangerous. And so we should avoid doing that thing. And then we do. We listen to it. Right. But we we know there's nothing actually dangerous about it. Like, you know, so like, yeah, getting rejected sucks. But, you know, you're rejecting yourself if you're not applying. Right. So. Right. Not an easy answer, but it's, uh, you know, I think it's worth working on it uh, to build that courage. And, you know, it's it's. Whether you get a position or not is not just about you, right? It's, it's there's so many other factors. So, so I hope that helps. All right, let's uh, let's cut in here to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we have other questions that I haven't previewed yet. So I'll figure it out when we come back from the break. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be right back. If you want to know what you can do. To show your support for what this podcast does for you, then head on over to Patreon and make a monthly contribution. You can give a dollar or five or ten. If you think you'll do it later, let me ask you when. You can set a reminder on your phone or do it now, because forgetting we're prone. Go to ADHDRewire.com slash Patreon. That's ADHD. Rewired.com slash Patreon. I've resorted to jingles. Go to ADHD Rewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks so much for your support. Our summer coaching sessions are full, but it's not too late to join the wait list. If you want to get on the wait list, you'll need to schedule a registration interview. Joining the wait list is your second chance opportunity to join us this summer for our 13th season of coaching and accountability groups. A 50% fully refundable deposit is required to join the wait list. Spots have opened up in the past. Things happen at the last minute. Join the wait list. Be first by scheduling your registration call now and schedule it soon. I'm limiting the wait list to three people per section. To join our summer coaching and accountability group waitlist, go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. All right. And we are back with uh, with Sean, who is here to ask a question. So Sean, go ahead. What is your question? Hi. um, And uh, Brandon, you did pronounce my last name correctly. That was pretty spectacular. (laughs) (laughs) Go me. Uh, McCon. You got it right. Yeah. <laughs> um, does ADHD ever, I mean, I was diagnosed when I was a little kid and I remember, you know, my parents were very active when I was younger and stuff, but does it ever get worse as an adult? I know coping mechanisms sometimes make it easier, but does it ever, does ADHD ever get worse as one grows up? Well, let's, let's, um, Pull that question apart a little bit and by, by uh, separating different aspects of ADHD. Okay. Um, we know okay. that impulsivity over time tends to say, stay around the same. Okay. Hyperactivity does tend to decrease and go to more of what you know, some people call cognitive hyperactivity. You know, having like 30 thoughts all at the same time. A lot of us can relate to that. Um, mm-hmm. At the age of 25, is when our, our prefrontal cortex is uh, considered fully developed. And so from the ages of 25 to 30, we have this, this supposedly really good five years. Our working memory is at our, our peak capacity. And then as far as working memory goes, it will start to do a steady decline from 30 all the way uh, you know, till we're done. Um, but I think, too, it, it'll... Environment is such a important um, uh, variable when it comes to the how symptomatic uh, we tend to be, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I tell people that I think it's a lot easier to be an adult with ADHD than it is to be a kid with ADHD because when you're a kid, you have, you know, if you're a middle school or high school student, you have like eight different bosses, none of them talk to each other, and you have to do all this work that you don't really care about, right? Like that sucks. That's hard to do. As an adult, you know, we can make more choices in our life. 
I think if you're as an adult, if you have a job that you hate, like you're going to struggle, right? If you're in an environment that is just not conducive to what you need, you're going to struggle, right? But Mm -hmm. as an adult, we can make more choices about those kinds of things. Doesn't mean they're easy choices, um, but they are, there are things that are more in our control. Um, We know it with, with women and they're, you know, when they hit the, premenopausal age and menopause, like the, the hormone changes are pretty significant. Right. So right. Um, I don't think that's going to affect you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's what's the difference between just cognitive uh, decline from age and what's the ADHD. So with strategies, with supports, with scaffolding, you know, for a lot of our adult life, there are sometimes ideally should be improving. Right, because the 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 more that we can, you know, one of the things when we look at uh, um, some of Russell Barkley's research on executive functioning as a um, a resource pool, so like throughout the day, our executive functioning decreases, but the the older we get, um, to a degree, the more strategies that we we use, uh, the more we f- uh, integrate self care into our lives, the greater our capacity for executive functioning. Uh, is. But if we stop using those strategies, we're going to decrease that capacity again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and there's also sort of on the on the making it worse side, right? Because Eric, Eric, Eric took the getting better side. So I'll take the opposite side. Our life can affect our ADHD symptoms, right? Like if if you have major life changes, your ADHD is more likely to flare up. Right, right. For one thing. So if you buy a new house, all of a sudden your executive functions are taxed pretty significantly because you have a bunch of new habits to learn. Um, Mm -hmm. If you have kids, if you get married or divorced or get a new job, all of those things can tax our executive functions, which can then flare up our ADHD um, Mm -hmm. because our coping mechanisms are not there anymore. And also related to that is the emotional side of ADHD and then emotional regulation, right? Yeah, when you're a kid, you don't have as much choice. And that can sometimes be great, right? Yeah, because you don't, especially when parents are being your, your um, you know, coaches. In a sense. Right. So having more choice can sometimes backfire depending on how you handle that. And also related to that is that lack of choice also tends to mean a lack of responsibility. And how we manage responsibility can significantly impact our anxiety level, which can significantly impact our ADHD. So yeah, it can get harder as you get older, depending on how you navigate some of the challenges that yeah. becoming an adult brings up. I, I definitely went through some major life shit. Uh, can I swear? Stuff. On this? Challenges. Stuff. Yes, Challenge. you can swear. I don't, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're now getting carried away. <laughs> Oh my God, don't beat me <laughs> over the last, at least last few years. I, I mean, on the other hand, I've realized that ADHD is still a big issue for me, but I like my, my, my psychologist, my new psychologist who I love was telling me that, that this, these particular things that have been happening in my life definitely could have made the ADHD worse. Talking about life stressors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Sort of life stressors. Absolutely. Help right. relate kept stuff stuff that yeah happened. that absolutely happens um and sometimes it's making the adhd worse and sometimes what it's doing is just revealing the adhd sometimes we've mm-hmm. kind of compensated and the adhd isn't that obvious because we've got all these strategies that we use and then right. all the strategies hit and we can't use those strategies anymore it's right. no different right. than not being able to take your adhd medication not taking right. your ADHD medication doesn't make your adhd worse it just reveals yeah. it yeah, 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 That's yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. I'm also thinking about temporarily going up on my Adderall while I mean, since I have, I have a lot of new opportunities these days, or or switching. Actually, something I I I think I I heard Eric talk about on his podcast at some point or something. Like, um, switching from regular Adderall to Adderall XR with like a late afternoon booster because like I've been on the same dosage since I don't know school when I was a kid and as an adult, I'm, you know, I need a lot more functional time than an eight hour school day. Even, even though I had homework back then, you know, it's still, it's like, I need to be functional all day. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are conversations to have with, with your doctor, with, with your psychiatrist. Right. Um, right, right. I'm going to. Great. 
Um, and there is a new medication out uh, uh, now called Mydeus, um, which is like a, a it's like the extended version of Adderall XR. So it's actually a, it's supposedly a 16 hour uh, coverage window. Um, so I'm, I've been taking it for the last, uh, about three or four months. Um, okay. and so it's, it's, it's good. And I only have to take it one time a day, which is, is, which is really nice. Means? Yes. If okay. their copy, if their copy is not my day, it's gave me my age back, somebody needs to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what? I said, if their copy isn't my day, it's gave me my days back. Somebody needs to get fired. <laughs> well, I was thinking, you know, my day is more productive now that I take my day. It's. There you go. <laughs> Can I ask one more question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I also just started taking, well, I, I used to take Prozac and for a little while I took Risperidol. I recently switched to Vibrid and Abilify. I'm not familiar with Vibrid. Vibrid, is, it, apparently it's a very new antidepressant. Okay. Um, taking it instead of Prozac and okay. Abilify and Risperidol. And I, I've, I've had interesting results. I, I started them about a week ago. Okay. It, it, um, in the beginning, I think the Bilify was making me, like the first few days, I was surprisingly lethargic. And then all of a sudden, I got full of energy, hmm. like really zippy. And finally, I think I'm mellowing down from that, which is nice. But I, I don't know. I, I'm still sort of experimenting to see how I react on them. So I, I just wanted your feedback. What do you think of those two medications? Well, I'm not a doctor, so I can't really speak to to uh, especially the SSRIs. Well, no, I mean, my doctor is speaking to it. Right. But what do you, uh, uh, my, what well, I would yeah. suggest if you're doing any kind of medication trials is to uh, uh, keep some kind of uh, like a daily log to document oh, your system your your uh, symptoms. Um, because otherwise, it's like you go to the doctor once a month, like how you know how have you been doing, and you're you're. Frame of time is right. like the last maybe 24 to 48 hours when it needs to be like the last month. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I mean, <laughs> I, you've got it nailed. I, I don't, I tend to shy away from medication questions just because that's not my area of expertise. I don't want to pretend that it is. And I see way too many people on the internet asking professor internet these kinds of questions well i mean so also I, the I get a little like, like that, that should be a, a segment for the show brendan and now it's time for <laughs> professor internet <laughs> you know opinions from different people always help well you know what they say as long as they're a decent you know as long as they're highly educated you know ad specialists such as both of you Right. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. I, I was going to go thank to you. the, uh, you know, opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. So, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's take our next question. All right. Thank you, Sean, very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Kat had a question. Adult ADD issue. After the Chad conference, I had a great month. All of these new techniques. I got lots of work done a month later. I'm back to not focusing enough. I work from home. I have increased my morning exercise and I got my sleep under control, but I need a trick to get focused one thing, to get focused one thing when I sit on down at my desk. Oh, thank you. On the first thing when I sit down at my desk. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So a couple of things I hear just in this question is that you're not back to how you were if you now have your your morning exercise and uh, sleep around the control if that's new from the time that you were at the conference. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, also, I'm concerned about time awareness because Chad was way more than a month ago. <laughs> I didn't even catch that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think there was a regional conference like a month or two ago. So I don't know oh, if, that, okay. if there was a, uh, yeah. So one thing that when I read this question, actually the first thing that came to mind was my very first Chad conference. Where I, you know, it was a very humbling experience where, uh, yeah, it was the, the regional one. All right. So my very first chat conference, you know, I went there thinking I was an expert because I have ADHD and I read a, maybe a couple books in ADHD, right? And then I got to listen to you know, Russell Barkley's keynote uh, on uh, his, his uh, theory of executive functions and just everything else. It was like the water hose of uh, or the fire hydrant of information. And um, so I learned so much, right? And for the next like six weeks, I was implementing so many new strategies. It was, I rocked it for like six weeks. And then the following six weeks, I didn't do shit. 
Like I was just stuck in neutral. And one of the things that I learned from that is that when you're in kind of go, go, go mode, when you're pushing those executive functions um, day after day without rest, you are going to deplete your ability to recharge your system. Right. So I wonder if that's potentially what happens. And I, and I get it. Like we're excited to try these new things out. And if we're having some success with it, like that, there's, that's really motivated to keep doing it. But we also need that, that pause and to be able to, to break a little bit too. So I would suggest that, uh, you probably are further along than maybe you're giving yourself credit for. Um, and the only reason I say this is there have been many times where I think like, um, you know, taking a, a big step back with something and, you know, and then people will point out to me what I've been doing. And I'm like, Oh yeah, you're right. I am doing that now. And I am doing that now. It's okay. So maybe I'm, I'm being a little hard on myself. So I don't, you know, I, I think to, to really, to be able to accurately assess that just requires some, a little bit of data tracking. Um, to, so you can have a, an objective uh, sense of how you're doing versus the, how you feel you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's a little nuanced, but I think it's important. So I mean, maybe if you're working with a coach or a therapist, you know, you can maybe uh, talk about that as well. And I'm going to throw a couple things yeah. in here. Don't sit down at your desk. Try you, that. You just like the standing desk. You're... I, I happen to love my standing <laughs> desk. Yes. But what if like, what if you, you work from home? So like bring your computer if you can, if it's a laptop and this is reasonable, Right. Can you work somewhere else? Can you stand in your kitchen and work at the counter? I mean, I've, I do that all the time when I'm stuck. I just go someplace else. Like I even have a treadmill that I will sometimes walk very slowly on while I, I mean, it's awkwardly placed for the computer, but maybe don't sit down, maybe stand or something. So, and what I'm thinking here is you're carrying that, that AM exercise vibe, the productivity of that into work, right? Sitting down, like the exercise is over you're now done. You get to relax kind of like in the physical message to your body of sitting down after exercise. If you keep standing, maybe that exercise momentum will sort of translate into cognitive momentum and help you move forward. Uh, so a couple other things too. So you asked the question, how do you all get started? And, uh, you know, since you hear me say every week that starting is the hardest part. I do know a thing or two about getting started um, because it, it is start, starting is to me, the hardest part. So one question I would ask myself is, do I know specifically what that first action step is? So I would take a look at your to-do list and um, see, do you have the, a, a what, I, what I refer to in my coaching groups as a vision verb? You know, a lot of people put, let's, let's see, put action verbs, but like there's a lot of these, so I call them pseudo verbs, things like look into, find out, like, Unless your task involves like opening a drawer, look into should not be on your to-do list, right? If it's a research question, Google as a verb should be on your to-do list, right? If it's a if it's a writing exercise, you have to write something. Maybe it's the first task is to open up a, a Word document. Um, so really like think about breaking it down to the smallest minute step until it doesn't feel overwhelming. And then do that one thing. And then ask yourself that same question again. All right, what's the what's the next thing that I can do? It doesn't feel that overwhelming, right? Um, and then going back to that uh, in the book, the one thing what they call the focusing question: What's the one thing that you could do, such by doing it would make it easier or necessary for you to you know get started? So using the idea of making it easier for you to get started. So what's one thing that you can do maybe in in the evening that would make it easier for you to get started? That next morning, um, you know, setting. So if you know ahead of time what your first task is going to be, it may make it easier for you to sit down and, and do it. Um, are you overwhelmed with how many things are on your to-do list? Like, man, we can only do one thing at a time, no matter how many things are on our to-do list. Mm -hmm. um, so, and so, something that keeps coming up with my clients recently, it's for the past month and a half, it's come up over and over again, is how location-based they are. A lot of my clients, in order to be productive, need to be in a certain kind of atmosphere. And so, like today, this morning, I went and met with a client, and I had another client I was working with yesterday who's having trouble getting started. And I was like, dude, go to the library. Like, just go somewhere else. Get out of your house. Go to the library. Do your work there. So today, on my way home from my, pre my, my first client, 
his library was like a five minute out of the way drive. So I was like, I'm going to go to your library and you better be there. Um, <laughs> so I met him at his library. Nice. I had some emailing stuff that I had to do. So I took an hour and banged out that stuff. He was there. He was started. We were good. I left him there. I'm sure he's okay. I hope. And so that's another option. Like go to a library, go to a coffee shop, go to, I don't know, like a Wegmans or a Whole Foods, a restaurant or a, a supermarket kind of place that has Wi-Fi, that has the resources you need, that's relatively quiet. Uh, avoid places with televisions and see what you can do to to get your work done somewhere else even. Yeah. And I think if those are all really good ideas and experiment, like everything that you try, consider that you're making this hypothesis and you're experimenting to see what works, right? Like mm-hmm. the more you try different things, the, the, the more you're going to figure out what works for you. Like for me, like going to the multiple locations, like that doesn't work for me. Like I need to sort of be in the same place doing my work. Right. Like, right. So, Cause that works for me. Cause I have, I'll just be, I'll wander too much. Mm-hmm. But for me, I'm like a ridiculous extrovert. So if I would spend too much time at home by myself, it saps my energy. But if I go to the library, even if I don't really talk to anybody, if I spend five minutes saying hello to the librarians and I sit down and do work, I feel like people are staring at me and I get a sense of accountability from that. Mm. And the extrovert in me is like, yeah, watch me type. I type like an awesome person. <laughs> I, you know, there's probably a lot like to that. I'm, I'm very much uh, of an introvert. And so like when I'm here in my office, like my door is closed. Like I don't have my door open in the office. Like I want to work. I want to stay focused. Like, you know, it's like, I like interacting with people, but it's like, I want to do my work. I want to stay focused. Mm-hmm. So it's what works for you. Like that's, that's right. what to do. What works for you. All right. We have time for, I think, one more question. Uh, right. Yes, Paul, that is where you, this is where you asked it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go with Sabah because we teased her question and then oh, yes. didn't do it. So um, her question is, how do you handle and stop distraction when dealing with high stress or crises? Mm. How do we deal with this? handling distraction when dealing with high stress or crises? When we're hitting it? one. We're hitting the beginning of it, which is just being aware that that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of where you have to start is know that that happens. Um, And then if you know it happens, sometimes you can plan in advance for like, if you know you're going to be in a high stress situation and you typically respond to high stress situations by getting distracted, maybe you can help pay more attention to the thing you need to pay attention to and sort of go in with the mindset of this is going to be high stress. I have to make sure I accomplish this goal in this situation, in this high stress situation, so you they, keep your on the one thing. All right. So, is it distraction from external sources, or is it distraction from internal uh, sort of processes going on in, in your body and your mind? Because I think that's you know those are, are different things to consider. Is it, or are you saying how do you handle distraction when you have so much going on and that's causing the stress and that's creating a sense of crisis? Um, I know for, for, for me, like when I, when I used to do more actual clinical crisis work, like I did great when, it, when the shit was hitting the fan, it was afterwards when I had to fill out the paperwork about the shit hitting the fan that I had problems. <laughs> right. Like, right. so yeah, I guess and how I'm, much of this is anxiety too? How much <laughs> of it is this like sensory issues, like sensory processing stuff? Mm-hmm. How much of this is just the anxiety of a crisis or a high stress situation? How much of it is that as opposed to. I'm in a high stress situation and I can't ignore the beeping or I get really tuned into the bluebird out the window. Like I sort of tune out from the stress and tune into the squirrels running around in the yard. Yeah. I shouldn't have picked squirrels. I have so many squirrels outside of my window at my office. It's like, Oh, it's comical. It's like really, cause they catch, they, they catch my eye all the time. It's like a bad joke. You're such a stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Brian, I think this is uh, all the time that uh, we have for today. I want to thank everyone for submitting their questions. We do this every second Tuesday of the month, Brendan and I. So, you know, sign up to so you get the notifications that we do this every month. Um, we really appreciate you being here, being part of the community. Um, we couldn't answer your questions without your questions. So um, I want to <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brendan, and for everyone who is uh, willing to, to ask questions. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Mm-hmm. Don't forget to check out uh, Brendan's podcast, ADHD Essentials. If you are a parent with a kid with ADHD or an educator, 
that's so uh, that's where to go for all things under 18 um over 18 <laughs> <laughs> you know where you're at adsu rewired all right Brendan, thank you thank you all right we'll see you next right. month yes indeed all right have a good day you too bye this is eric tibbers thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. Learn more about the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. Com. Support ADHD Rewired and help replenish our coaching group scholarship fund by becoming a monthly patron at patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. Different levels of support get different perks. You can give just a buck or three or five bucks a month or more. Every little bit helps. And it's an awesome way for you to let me know that you value this show the community, and everything else we do. That's patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see select interviews and other videos I've made. The ADHD Rewired community is now a secret group on Facebook, so that's one less reason to not just be a passive listener, but to be an active member of our community. Fill out our short screening form at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We screen everyone before they join. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities or on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Quora, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, your family, your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. If you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone or even do it for them. And if you really love this episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things you really can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on the Apple Podcast app or on Stitcher or any other podcast app that supports and accepts ratings and reviews. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Need some ideas on where to start other than Brene Brown's Gifts of Imperfection? Darren Greatly, Rising Strong, or her six-hour recorded workshop, The Power of Vulnerability, then I would recommend The One Thing by Gary Keeler. Oh, and if you by any chance know Brene Brown, please let her know how grateful I am for all of her work and what she means to me and the ADHD community, and that she's welcome on my show anytime. And in the one in like seven billion chance that Brene, you're listening, please come and be a guest. Thanks. This is Eric Tivers reminding you, keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. And no matter how hard it all feels, remember, we can do hard things. Until next time.